Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our second round of Sleep Salons at the Sociability of Sleep. Uh, my name is Alana Thane. I'm stepping in just at the last minute for my co-director, Alex Kaminska, who's having some technical difficulties um, to host uh, this Sleep Salon kicking off our new year. Um, and we're very excited to have you here. Welcome back. If you're new, um, welcome to our project. You can find out much more about our project on the sociabilityofsleep.ca, um, as well as viewing all of our past sleep salons. And uh, if you're returning, thanks for coming back. We're excited to continue the conversation. Um, I just briefly want to do a land acknowledgement that um, uh, our project, Sociability of Sleep, is located on the unceded territories of the Haudenosaunee and, um, oops, pardon me, still having technical difficulties, um, the Haudenosaunee and uh, in Jojage, also known as Montreal. And we recognize and respect the traditional territories of the custodianship of um, the holders of the traditional territories of Chojage. Um, pardon me if I'm a little bit um, <laughs> off script at this point. Um, let me introduce our, uh, our speakers today. And I'm also just going to switch back to my, uh, my text. Um, we're really excited to have uh, these two speakers for our, um, our current sleep salon on uh, quantified sleep. And so part of what we've been doing in the, in the sociability of sleep is thinking about how new technological interfaces are uh, both entering sleep, allowing us to have new access to uh, an experience that's often quite opaque to us ourselves. Um, we sort of encounter sleep in the aftermath. And one of the promises of a lot of technological interfaces is that we're gonna have a kind of window into um, what we're actually experiencing. Um, and one of the things that uh, Alex and I were really struck by when we first started putting together this uh, project was the idea that um, as we're invited more and more to peer into our own sleep, um, it's, we've actually seen the emergence of a new condition uh, called orthosomnia or straight sleep, where people become poor sleepers as a result of all the data that they're getting and their attempts to kind of live up to these uh, digital ideals. So we're really excited to have two speakers today, Anna Nolda uh, Nagale and Adam Har Horowitz, um, who are going to talk about um, these new technologies that read, quantify, and optimize the, the dormant body. And I'm going to start by introducing Anna, and then we'll introduce uh, who's going to speak first, and then we'll introduce uh, Adam. So Anna Nolda Nagale is a design researcher, creative technologist, and publisher. She's a PhD candidate in media and arts technology at Queen Mary University of London, an associate lecturer in design management at the London College of Communication, as well as founding editor of the Posthumanist magazine. Her current research analyzes the effects and affects of wearable sleep trackers on user subjectivities, culture, and environment through a critical posthumanist lens using discourse analysis and autoethnography. Anna founded the biannual and bilingual magazine The Posthumanist, which is a publication about more than human art, design, technology, and writing, and the inaugural issue on sleep launched in September 22. So everybody can go check that out right after this talk. So thank you so much for being here, Anna, and I turn it over to you. Hello everyone and thank you Lana for this nice introduction um, and thanks so much for inviting me to this. I'm really excited to be here because I've been following this series for a while and uh, I actually met a few collaborators through this and I'm also excited to be here with Adam because I think I read his work as part of my own research and so yeah it's just a great opportunity to be here I guess. Let me just make this full screen. So yeah, thanks for the introduction again. And today I'm gonna be talking about um, my study, one study of my PhD research project um, with the title, The Subjectivities of Wearable Sleep Trackers. And um, I'll, I conducted a discourse analysis around um, wearable sleep tracking for my PhD um, and specifically the discourse around quantified sleep and um, I'm gonna introduce you to this today. So I'll start with, sorry, how do I continue with the slides? Just clicking, okay, sorry. <laughs> and so I'll start by outlining a little bit about the background and context of my study and, and my PhD research. And then I'll introduce 
sleep trackers as social agents, which was one of the findings uh, or the findings of this first study and how I tried to map and understand these affective relationships of sleep tracking um, between the wearable devices and their um, users and how they are furthermore involved in the more complex um, developments that are socio-technical and ecological developments that are going on in the wider world. And at the end, I will end by introducing you to my very new publishing project, the Posthumanist magazine, with the first issue being all about sleep, and which sort of emerged out of this research as well. And as a short introduction or a introduction to the background, which I think actually that a lot of you might be familiar with since you're here today, is this sleep crisis or perceived sleep crisis that we as humans are experiencing at the moment. Um, in the last couple of years or maybe the last decade, there is more and more research coming out around the, sleep, the benefits of sleep or the importance of sleep for physical and mental health. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of studies saying that sleep, sleep quality and duration is declining due to uh, chronic emotional stress mainly caused by many factors um, inter internal to ourselves or external. But at the same time, this, this systemic sleep crisis that is described is addressed with mostly technical, medical or individual solutions. Um, individual is the most important or the most interesting aspect for my own research uh, because sleep is not at all individual. Sleep is um, relational. I think Alana said that in the introduction as well, how sleep can only be known about from an observer. Um, it's sort of an unconscious activity or we can only know the aftermath or before we're going to sleep, um, but we can't experience in itself. But sleep trackers allow us to observe ourselves somehow. At the same time, there are social actors themselves and uh, really actively involved in recomposing this relationship between the human and the non-human in the sense that it creates sleep schedule, schedules for us, sets up a sleep hygiene based on this dialogue between the bio data. A critical, I, I'll take a, a crit, for my own PhD or for my research, I take a critical post-humanist stance um, because sleep trackers themselves are designed following a, a human-centered paradigm, but um, with this post-humanist stance that allow me or allows us to open up new perspectives on how digital sleep trackers or wearable sleep trackers could be developed going forward. Um, just at this stage, I'd like to just use this idea of post-humanist, um, which is a philosophy based on many indigenous ideas from various cultures. So I'd like to, at this stage, um, it relativizes the human exception above other beings in this world and it includes the relationship or it pays special attention to the relationships between all the actors involved in sustaining life on earth their mutual vulnerabilities and also the use of the mutual care for each other and since sleep is not a human-centered paradigm at all um, sleep technology or this commercialization of sleep around the individual doesn't seem to be addressing the sleep crisis sufficiently. And so I was asking, or for this discourse analysis, I was first trying to understand what subjectivities this quantified sleep discourse actually produces and what relationships of effect within this networks, network exists. So within the human, uh, the internal and external and also other beings. And to do this, um, me, I conducted the discourse analysis together with my supervisors as well. We looked at um, academic research from the fields of human-computer interaction, which is the field I'm doing my PhD in, um, social sleep research and medical sleep research, alongside other visual and textual artifacts from public-facing media. And we also conducted 11 user interviews of people using regularly using the sleep tracking functionalities on their um, personal fitness devices. And then also spoke to six experts who are working for any of these companies that the users have been, um, been using in the interviews. 
and specifically in the in any capacity relating to the sleep tracking functionality of this device. And uh, last but not least, for the data, we also interviewed the devices themselves following um, a methodology with the title um, Interviewing Digital Objects, which was sort of re woven into the interviews and into the analysis of the other artifacts we did. And from this study or from this, from this huge, a lot of data points or a lot of materials that we collected, um, we then tried to bring them down and try to understand what are their social roles, what are the subjectivities that both the devices and the users can take in this relationship of tracking your own sleep. And uh, for, for ease of understanding, but also for summarizing these findings, we sort of created these personas. So first I'll show you device personas and then the user personas and then how they both are in interaction with each other. So sleep tracking devices can be companions in the sense that they're always with the user. They're usually worn like 24 hours a day. And they build a quite intimate relationship with the user, are trusted sometimes more than their own uh, feeling. They give a sense of security and control over the self and they're non-judgmental or perceived as non-judgmental and uh, can raise awareness and just keep track of the user, a sort of perform a sort of care on their user. They can also be a therapist in the sense that they assist with diagnosis, treatment, and the cure, or promise even the cure of sleep disorder. They can monitor health symptoms, or they allow the user to monitor their own health symptoms. Are they very much inspired by medical technology and aspire to be accurate or to and the sleep lab or polysomnography. And often these sleep trackers as therapists are also used in scientific research or for um, pharmaceutical studies, for example, in the wild, as they call it, because the users can take them home and um, track their sleep from there rather than going in the sleep lab. And it uh, might provide a feeling of control over one's own health. Um, a sleep tracker can also be a coach in that it encourages the user to make better lifestyle decisions or become their best self. They can personalize the sleep plan. And um, it also establishes new terms, which are sort of borrowed from, from fitness trackers or from, from fitness in general, um, like sleep scores and sleep readiness. And it put them, put the sleep always in relation to uh, uh, or their recovery always in relation to physical performance and increasing performance, optimizing performance. And this coach also invites to a competition with the self that you, for example, to always try to get better sleep scores or with peers by comparing to similar, uh, like apparently similar people based on the data and how they sleep and how you could be sleeping better. A sleep tracker could also be a mediator. It, uh, the, as a mediator that correlates the bio data with the lifestyle, um, it encourages to find balance between behavior, feelings, and natural circadian rhythms. The mediator invites reflection to take informed decision, but accuracy or accuracy here is not so important because uh, it's more about finding a personal balance or an individual balance and helps to make the invisible visible, like the sleep data that we can't observe otherwise. And uh, sleep trackers could also be a teacher, which is, um, I forgot to say at the start, but at the, in the bottom among like next to these collages or below these collages, you can see um, where most of these data points were found. So the for example, mostly from academia or from experts, is that the teacher, uh, that the sleep tracker as a teacher is there to provide information, insights, and knowledge of sleep, but also um, informs the public about sleep, is involved in generating new knowledge by being part of studies, for example, um, and just gives suggestions for new habits and tries to help make sense of all these sleep data points that are um, collected throughout the night. And the last, um, the last 
sleep tracker subjectivity we have here is the Informa, which was described both in some academic papers by expert interviews and in media, but doesn't seem to be a concern by the users. At least the ones we spoke to was that sleep, that does the sleep tracker monitors the sleeping human, it collects the data and then generates and distributes knowledge from this data first to the company, but maybe that creates the sleep tracker, but even um, ha might have wider influences. And here the data can be often considered more accurate than the personal experience. For example, in this one court case, which was an example where the data was used to, um, to solve some sort of crime, uh, but the data could also be used to influence um, users' decision-making or behaviors, and it can, it, certainly can also discriminate as it's based or developed by humans who do have certain bias as well. And then alongside these uh, device personas, we developed three user personas, which is also very simplified. And um, every device and every user can, of course, change their role throughout life or depending on the context, depending on the relationships they're in. Um, but we found some patterns and one, the first one I want to introduce is the sleep improver Liz. Um, she uh, suffers from um, PTSD at the moment and has a lot of mental health issues. So she's finding it very difficult to sleep and um, she relies on being pills to act to go to sleep at all. And her goal is to get asleep and her why she got the sleep tracker was to help her get off the sleeping pills, improve her mental health. And seeing this data outside of her own experience gives her a feeling um, of security because she feels like she can't trust herself sometimes or how she feels. And it reinforces her confidence by seeing the data um, on the screen. So one participant we interviewed would be saying, for example, that she... Um, sometimes trusts the data more than her own feeling because she just feels bad all the time. But when the aura ring in that case says that she's doing fine, then she feels better and feels she has more control over her actions. So she is trying to improve her sleep. And then um, sort of more in the middle of a, if we imagine them on a scale, is the sleep maintainer Robert, who is who got the a Fitbit mainly to just me measure um, his sleep, keep an eye on it, look for, l learn more about sleep and the body and how um, recovery and activity play or inter interfere, like interact with each other. He's also interested to spot anomalies in his data. So for him, the sleep data isn't so interesting as long as it's normal, but when he sees something that out of the ordinary he wants to look more into that he is monitoring he's using it to monitor his overall health and to balance his workout and rest and he normally says he's normally a quite um good sleeper a naturally good sleeper so he doesn't really need it to improve his sleep and the uh, last one we have is the sleep optimizer, Brenda. So she's sort of at an extreme of the end of the, of the other end of the other two. So she um, is an athlete or a CEO, and she's really trying to make every, the most of every second of her life. And she's, she got a sleep tracker or she got the whoop band to optimize her sleep track, her sleep schedule, achieve better fitness goals, uh, monitor her health and um, yeah, make the best, most of every second of her day, but also to establish some boundaries for herself because she describes herself more as that she works really hard and um, that keeps her up a lot and she feels like sleep isn't even so important, so she would prefer to just not sleep at all. But this reminds her that she does need to sleep sometimes. And to then try to understand how they um, interact or how they relate to each other. This is an attempt, <laughs> a diagram to see how they all, um, how they are positioned, like how intimate the relationship between the sleep tracker and this user is. So a user could be the, try, uh, be, could be on the improver end, so trying to make something better in their life or just 
try to maintain or have control over the current status, or on the other side, um, being an optimizer and trying to make most the most of everything uh, and trying to optimize their sleep. And depending on their goals, the sleep tracker can then change how they are how they present themselves to the user. And the therapist, companion, and coach are quite um, quite in a quite close relationship with the user. The teacher informs as well the user as well as others, like other audiences who might just read about sleep um, but not be involved in tracking their sleep or measuring their sleep at all. Similar, the mediate role has the mediator who balances the user's lifestyle and external factors with how they're feeling. And the informant is sort of almost hidden from the user and it's more uh, outside in the hands of, of, of companies or maybe governments or wherever the data is, but that doesn't really um, affect the user directly. And then for after trying to understand this like inner relationships, I tried to look a bit further, like expand this analysis and see what else is affected by um, by using or by this very popular um, application or this very common application now of tracking one's sleep and how sleep at the start, I think I mentioned that this sleep crisis is mainly due to um, chronic stress, um, which causes um, bad sleep. So there is one sort of circle which reinforces itself, which shows that sleep trackers might not be the best suited to introduce address the sleep crisis is that if you are stressed and sleep badly and then get a sleep tracker which might help to improve your sleep uh, in the short in a short uh, time if it works um, helps to be more productive and be more active but also then work more or consume more or just um, engage more which can lead to again more stress and anxiety and again to worse sleep and the two yellow things I want to highlight on the side is that it leaves out um, certain groups so uh, first of all to get a sleep tracker or try to improve your sleep in the first place leaves out those who can't afford to improve their sleep both um, financially or um, socially can't afford it, like a mother of young children, for example, might have a really hard time improving their sleep uh, anyway, so the sleep tracker wouldn't help. Um, but it also increases then the social divide by those who can improve their sleep and use the sleep for optimizing their lives versus those who can't. And after that, I found there's sort of a second circular relationship that we can put into this is the relationship to the climate or the planetary health by um, if we start by looking at this uh, at the end of the outer circle so more work and more consumption also needs it really leads to like more extraction of natural resources or more um uh, yeah more negative impact of the human and on the environment so the planetary health declines and this again leads to increased anxiety which uh, is is a lot of uh, there's a lot of written things written about this about climate fear climate anxiety which can lead to bad sleep again and then trying to improve your sleep through this angle of let's improve our productivity as well just reinforces this and this planetary health decline and stress again affects mostly those who are already at the margins of society and similar to this or when i finished writing this i found on um, I think this was on Instagram, a post by The Guardian here in the UK about a paper that was published in 2022 about rising temperatures um, eroding human sleep globally. So, which is really directly linking this climate crisis to worse sleep because global warming is actually, is increasing nighttime temperatures faster than during the day, which leads to a decrease in hours that are um, they have a good rest, which affects of like women more than men. It affects the elderly more than younger people, and the increase of global warming um, or the degree of global warming again affects um, those in less affluent nations in the first place. So this is sort of a similar 
argument, I think, to the one I made before. And these are just, these, these are findings from this one study I did for the PhD. So I don't have a solution yet, but I'm just interested in how um, approaching the development of sleep track or using this data of quantified sleep um, in a more holistic way or in a more, yeah, from a post-humanist angle, which includes the more than human as well. And so that's why I want to, before I finish, talk a little bit about how this magazine came about. The idea of this started in uh, in the pandemic, as maybe many of you, I don't know, <laughs> started some new projects during just being at home all the time. I liked to read a lot and I read even more um, during the pandemic, being at home all the time. And uh, I like to read magazines. And so I just started working on this idea of making a magazine about post-humanism to combine different ideas from um, science and technology, but also um, other, other, other sciences, other in, not even sciences, other industries and other creative fields, because this interdisciplinary work is quite uh, important for me. And I want to show you some uh, of the content, which is actually related to quantified sleep. On the cover, we have uh, uh, the cover artist is called Daria Martin. She's an American artist living in London. And uh, she made two video works with the title Tonight the World and Refuge. Both of them are based on her grandmother. Her grandmother, this, this is another a screenshot of it there with some shots from these or video stills. Um, one is actually a video, one is a computer game or an interactive uh, video um, based on her grandmother's dream journal, which she left her um, when she died. And her grandmother started to track all her dreams from the age of 16 when she was fleeing Czech the Czech Republic or her home in the Czech Republic to move to America from the Nazi to flee or escape the Nazi invasion. And she was sort of on this quest to really understand herself. And she left 20,000 pages of dream journal entries and really tried to understand all these characters and all these objects that are appearing in her in her dream. And I think this sheer number, and I, I would really love to go through these and just see what she discovered and how she analyzed this. Um, then the other example is uh, is this um, spread by Heda Overholm Torren. She is uh, she just graduated from LCC, where I also work in London, and she was interested in, or she's interested in the technological gaze, and she installed this little camera above her bed, which would take a picture every time she moves. And I just think it's an interesting way of um, visualizing what this sleep data or sleep tracking is looking at, um, or how it looks, how it is maybe perceived better, what it means to have this other being looking over us while we sleep. And the last thing is an interview by Michael Grandner, who I interviewed as part of my research. He's one of the experts I interviewed. And what stood, he's, a, he's a certified behavioral sleep psychiatrist. <coughs> Sorry. And um, it was really interesting talking to him about the history of sleep tracking and where this even comes from. And how a sleep himself from this behavioral perspective is very much an embodiment of the world around you, as in that it's not individual at all and it doesn't depend on your body or physique at, at all. But what else blew my mind in this interview was that how, how this polysomnography or sleep tracking or the sleep lab even evolved and what our sleep, our consumer grade sleep trackers are actually based on is quite arbitrary. And still there is a lot of conversation about how accurate they actually are. I think in my, I analyzed all this, for this discourse analysis, all the documents with the software and could count all the words and the word I counted most was accuracy after, after like and and I and these filling words, which is quite interesting because the question of what is accurate sleep tracking is quite an old one, I think, at this stage. And, yeah, this is just the cover or the last page of the magazine with an index, um, which I made 
uh, at the end by when all the content was finished by just looking through and almost analyzing the magazine as I did analyze the other data from my study and try to see which words are reappearing in different contexts and in different from different fields and how they do they actually all contribute to this idea of posthumanism and sleep or sleep through the lens of posthumanism and and what we can learn from that and yeah that's where i'm up with my research and i hope you enjoyed this and <laughs> i'll stop sharing now i think i'm okay i think it's how i was going to talk oh thank you very much thank you so much anna um i'm glad to be able to join you now on uh and then my Wi-Fi is working. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that. And um, we'll uh, slide on over right on to the next speaker um, who I'll introduce. Um, so, um, and we'll have questions at the end uh, as we normally do. And feel free to put questions in the chat uh, if you have some um, that you don't want to forget. We'll be sure to ask them during the Q&A. Um, so Adam, um, Adam uh, Har Horowitz's work is focused on cognitive science. So we're going uh, somewhere else a little bit with a particular focus on sleep and dreams. Uh, he's interested in how brain science can expand and interact with art, technology, and policy. Uh, he's recently a graduate of um, MIT, where he worked on devices, on teams building devices for tracking sleep and guiding dream, uh, dream content. Right now, he's, be he's bringing his tools to different labs for guiding dreams and nightmare treatment um, working on neuroscience-based prison policy adv adv advocacy with the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, and working on ways to bridge art and neuroscience in ways that go uh, beyond the ornamental with the MIT Museum Studio. Uh, and perhaps he has time to sleep sometimes. Uh, it's hard to tell. So uh, I'll leave it to you, Adam, um, from here. Thanks so much. Thanks, y'all. Thanks a bunch for having me. Um... There, this is really helpful for me thinking about um, actually what my what my devices are for, and I think the Q and A is going to be a lot of fun. But um, I have I have also been watching the, the 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 sleep salons and got to see Claudia and Tony and Elizabeth and um, there's some folks on here um, like Dr. Croker who were very helpful for my thesis. So it's great to talk to y'all. Um, cool. Let me share my screen. Okay, can someone give me a thumbs up that there's a big blue, big blue? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I'm i going to speak for, let me, yeah, um, I've got y'all for like 25 minutes. Um, and hopefully this is useful. Um, uh, lots of, lots of um, threads to pull on. Um, so my name's Adam, um, and I um, am at MIT. I just graduated. I'm a postdoc here um, for a little while. And um, I think just before starting, um, I think it's really useful to say that um, none of what I'm about to show you was done alone. A lot of folks, um, some who you know, like Michelle Carr and Tony Zadra and and, and Claudia, who's on this call, and Tori, who's on this call, have been incredibly generous with me as I've tried to explore the sleep and dream world, um, and I'm really grateful. Um, and I think I'm mostly here because of what a subset of those people did with me, um, which is this, this device we call the Dormio, and the, the Dormio is um, indeed a sleep tracker, but I don't, I don't really know if it's a teacher or an informant I don't know quite what it is. And so maybe we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, I, I, I built a sleep tracker, not because I was interested in tracking uh, sleep, but because I was interested in interfacing with dreams. Um, and so this Dormio is part of a larger dream engineering toolkit or dream incubating toolkit, which we make. Um, and so some of these tools um, take in signals like EEG, which I think um, you'd be more familiar with from the polysomnography literature. And then some of them are focused only on EOG or some are focused more on biomarkers like cortisol. Um, but the, the Dormio focuses on um, heart rate and electrodermal activity and muscle flexion. Um, and it focuses on them because it's really only interested in N1 um, in, 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 in the beginning 
of sleep and sleep onset. Um, and the reason I decided to focus on N1, which I think is relevant for this conversation, um, is there was already some literature on the possibility of incubating dreams in N1. So there was um, the, the sort of famous Tetris study um, showing that participants who played Tetris for long periods of time with multiple days would then have um, these images of Tetris as they fell into sleep, these hypnagogic images, these micro dreams. Um, and then also there was work um, showing that you could get verified reports. So there's another um, quite well-known uh, study from Horikawa um, on taking uh, just pure brain data and predicting dream reports um, and verifying them. And, and within the sort of larger sleep science context, this is Francesca Siclari saying, um, studies like these convincingly show that dream reports can be trusted as a research tool and they don't represent confabulations or unreliable indications. And I think it's important to say that um, MIT in particular um, is sometimes conservative in what it regards as sort of serious science and having something um, like verified report um, is really important for the cognitive science community here. Um, and these, these two things, incubation and verified report really come down, I think, to control in the sense of a controlled experiment, the capacity to control an experiment on dreams. And then also the kind of objectification or quantification of a dream, a dream not as um, a story, which requires the whole context of a life to be understood, but um, a dream instead as uh, uh, a set of activation in visual cortex um, that is uh, not only something we can image, but something we can predict. Um, it makes the dream seem like something we can fit into the laboratory. And I think that this kind of thinking, um, since we're talking today about quantification, can can and does go too far. Um, I think, for instance, um, here's an article from MIT saying rats dream about their tasks during slow wave sleep. This is from research out of Matt Wilson's lab about hippocampal reactivations and um, saying, oh, look, we see some sort of reactivation of waking perception during sleep. And so we must be seeing a dream because a dream is nothing more than brain activation. When in reality, who knows what a rat is dreaming? Because who knows what a rat is thinking? So, so, so I think we have to always um, remind ourselves to be humble when quantifying. The reason I care about quantification or control or fitting the dream into the laboratory um, is uh, because more than 50 years after the discovery of REM sleep launched the study of uh, sleep research, the study of dreaming is really in many ways in its infancy. And this is Aaron um, Wamsley, I'm sure many of you many of you know. And um, she thinks, and I, I, I agree that there's a perception that when occurring during sleep, um, cognition isn't a legitimate area of scientific inquiry. Um, and at least in, in my context here, um, one thing that looms really large when talking about um, whether studying cognition in sleep or dreams or sleep meditation, whether studying it is um, a serious area of inquiry, psychoanalysis looms really large. And um, so I, I, I wasn't particularly aware um, that there, that, that it was so widespread. So in, in, in the state, 75% of psychiatrists in, 60, in 1966 report using Freud's psychodynamic method, method when, when treating patients. And Cambridge here, Massachusetts, was um, specifically a, a psychoanalytic hub. Um, but then um, there's this purge of psychoanalysis where um, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science who's responsible for, in a big way, um, the kind of empirical falsification, the, 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 the things that, that at least I think of as serious science, um, a priori hypotheses, falsifiable hypotheses, um, that, 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 that the kind of canonical example of pseudoscience is psychoanalysis for, for Popper. And um, and probably shouldn't quote somebody who's on the call, but um, so here's from, from um, Dr. Croker from The Sleep of Others. The American psychiatric establishment begins this full-scale purge of psychoanalytic ideas uh, where um, I think in many ways we throw out the baby with the, the bath water. So um, here's Tony Zadra. 
Um, that in rejecting Freud, society also rejected the notion of paying much attention to our dreams. So just to, just to summarize, um, I think that the study of dreaming in some ways is in its infancy today in the neuroscience or cognitive science context, specifically um, because there's this kind of canonical example of pseudoscience um, focused on the impossibility of, uh, uh, um, of, of these a priori falsifiable hypotheses with, with regards to dreams. But um, I, think, I think that often when in my department people say, oh, you can't study dreams, you can't do serious science on dreams, you can't quantify dreams, you can't control dreams, that what they're really saying is that psychoanalysis feels a little slippery um, to them. And they kind of sometimes confuse the methodology of study with the content um, that they're studying. And so I think, at least within this kind of scientific context, that dream control and sleep tracking can help us attend again, can um, give a kind of uh, entryway such that we can open up a window into sleep and dreams in this kind of a scientific context. So just to hammer home the kind of um, popper point, just to give you an example of, of, of why I think dream control and quantification are interesting. If we take, for instance, a recent paper out of the Mass Gen, the, uh, the Harvard um, Addiction Clinic, um, here's a, a quote. Subjects who had numerous using dreams and relapse dreams were more likely to have greater drug cravings and return to active drug use. This is a really interesting potential association between dream content and really important daytime behavior, but it's limited to post hoc correlation. And the reason is because the way it works is we look at a behavior like relapse, we look backwards, we see using dreams, which is mixed up with all sorts of other factors. And we say, oh, it must be causing relapse. But this is sort of similar to saying, oh, um, a rooster always crows before the dawn and thus the rooster crowing must be causing the dawn. It's not a, a great way to think about causal relationships. If we want to actually focus on the contribution of these using or relapse dreams, um, what we want to do instead um, is we want to be able to control the dream content. So what if we take in a population of subjects, we purposefully give some using and some quitting dreams, not saying this is ethical, just trying to outline an experimental possibility. We then make the dream content an independent variable. We identify a causal relationship. We have a treatment target and we do it all in a way that satisfies Mr. Popper. So I'm building sleep trackers as dream control interfaces to potentiate a new kind of scientific experiment to let dreams enter, whether these are uh, treatment targets, whether these are in a subclinical or non-clinical context. Um, I think they it, it, that that this kind of sleep tracker as dream interface offers a whole new kind of whole new kind of knowledge in the dreamscape. So um, I'll tell you just for ten minutes about some of the specifics, um, so you can give me your thoughts. Um, so this is the Dormio device, and the Dormio device um, works by tracking changes in electrodermal activity, in muscle tension and in heart rate. And these are things that change as people slip into sleep. Um, and we know this from past research showing that, for instance, the squeeze amplitude, electromyography, the, the squeeze amplitude in somebody's hand actually corresponds uh, really well in its changes in sleep onset with the theta, delta, and alpha power changes in their EEG, with their behavioral responses in task. And so we can actually learn a lot about sleep onset um, without even looking at the brain. The body falls asleep as the brain does too. And so we can take our dormia device and we can set it up with a PSG and we can see some of the kind of canonical, canonical si uh, 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 signals of sleep onset, like attenuation of uh, alpha that go along with um, just something as simple as a hand opening or heart rate variability changing. Um, the other thing, um, just because we're talking about sleep trackers that I think is exciting here um, is that typically many, many people on the call use polysomnography, um, which is wired and high cost and requires a technician and is um, immobile. And I think there's a, 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 reason, a reason that a lot of sleep science um, has stayed in the laboratory or a reason that, you know, um, my father who had to um, just go uh, do a, 
an apnea related sleep study has to go into the lab and the first night effect and lots of confounds, which we all know about. I'm really excited about something like the Dormio device because it's wireless, it's low cost, it doesn't require a um, technician. It has the possibility for some more, I think, ecological validity because of that. And the way that this sleep tracker dream incubation device works, super, super simple. Um, you're awake, you have a calibration period, you start slipping into sleep. As you slip into sleep and you get into what Dormio with this device defines as sleep onset, it says, literally with a little speaker, it says, think about a tree. It says something specific, a theme. And then after some preset period of time that you can set, which is your chosen sleep depth, um, it asks you for a dream report and then it records your response. Maybe you're eating tree broccoli. And all of this goes on an app, um, but also we have a version um, that works on a, a desktop. And um, we actually just finished up a study with 80 folks at uh, Duke University, um, where we sent them these tools and uh, they only used this um, desktop version. We've used the mobile version. We've tested things um, in, a, in a few different interfaces and we actually hit right around the same percentages of dream incubation. Uh, in, in, in terms of direct incorporation of a chosen theme into dreams. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that. Um, so we're hovering around um, 90 to 92% of subjects in a period of an hour um, coming into the lab and napping and slipping in and out of sleep, slipping in, getting an incubation, coming out, giving a report, slipping in, getting an incubation, coming out, getting a report. Um, about 92% of them report one or more dreams with a direct incorporation. This was a study um, uh, around incorporating uh, the word tree, the dormy device said, um, think of a tree. Um, and about, if you look at the total dream reports from that group of, um, this was a study with uh, 50 people, um, about 67% of total dream reports have a direct reference to tree. But I always think it's nice to actually hear what people are talking about. Um, so here are some audio snippets from this study, dream control. I was like also looking down, but I saw me. I saw like a primary school version, me playing the flute under the tree. Um, so this is perhaps a memory coming up. The word tree brings up a primary school memory and creates the environmental context for the dream. Um, or here's another example. And then um, at the word reach the top, Canopy. Um, I, I feel like I became part of the tree, but I'm not really sure like which part became the tree. So I actually I try to move my arm in my dream. Um, and uh, but it it was very heavy. I cannot see my arm, and uh, and uh, it just seems that the arm becomes the branch. But so this is a very different sort of dream where um, the sleeper seems to uh, uh, physically turn into the tree and experience actually um, arm immobility, which is very interesting in terms of dream embodiment. Um, and I'm gonna skip this thing. Um, and I just wanna say that um, I'm in, in, in the kind of context of paper writing, um, I'm interested in just um, whether or not there was direct or indirect incorporation of this specific theme into a dream. Um, but in, in the larger context, I'm interested in what the experience is of a user. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, give a quick video of um, somebody who uh, used this Dormio device for a period of time, um, what it felt like for them. Ooh. That was trippy. <laughs> oh my God. I like it felt like I like it was the first time I kind of could come up with like a cohesive sort of like story in a way. I've never been, I've never been able to do that. I remember almost kind of like the entire thing in sequence. Normally in dreams, I can hear I I, I can I can remember sort of like moments, but I can never think of like the, the what was I remember what the connective sort of tissue of each of those sequences are. I was able to create my own world and create my own game 
but in something that I love. Like it was like creating my my own fan fiction. Wow. I think I just came, I think I just came up with a cool story of like a destiny fan. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> this was this looks very I didn't even think that would be possible. So this was this was great. So yeah, and and and, and just within the the context of um, this community and this talk, I think it's so exciting for somebody to have an experience which is mediated by a sleep tracker, but their experience upon awakening is not one of looking back at their sleep data and saying, oh, I was in N1 for this period of time. The sleep tracker is what enables the recall of hypnagogia, what enables the incubation of hypnagogia. Um, the recall is what opens up a kind of I think a cognitive space which is largely inaccessible um, or forgotten, um, and 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 so upon awakening, um, I do, I don't think the focus is so much on the device as on the experience that the device made possible. And so, yeah, I'm really interested in the kind of distinctions that Anna was making. Um, so we take this device and we say, oh, this is exciting. Um, here's a tutorial. Um, so out in Make Magazine, everything is open source. The hardware is open source. If people want to make it at home, and we've been really excited that people have been um, actually making their own versions of this Stormy device at places like Duke. And then we have an ongoing study with some psychiatrists at the VA around um, nightmares. And so there's this vision that comes together of, oh, um, what if in the future we're getting... Um, some smell to change dream affect and um, uh, perhaps some uh, stimulation of the muscles via EMS to change sensory motor content of dreams. Um, all the while we're recording dream reports um, and uh, we're waking people up and collecting questionnaire data. And it turns um, the home sleep environment into a, a kind of um, theater where we can direct our dreams in a whole new way. And um, I think this strikes some people as a little scary, um, but in, in, in this context, I think it's especially important to remember that um, us kind of poking um, and prodding and uh, hopefully um, sending people home with tools that increase their agency over their own dream content um, is in a, a really old tradition, um, back to the tradition of, healing with dreams in places like the Asclepion, um, uh, into traditions of um, indigenous dreaming or prophetic dreaming in Judaism or the Istikhar in Islam. There, there are so many traditions where tools are offered to engage with dreams in a new way, to engage with your day in a new way. And I think um, for me, all of these tools, I see them within the context of this kind of quote, um, which is from Dorothea Lang, where a camera is a tool for learning how to see without a camera, meaning um, around me right now, there are all these forms, there's all this shadow, there's all this beauty, there's all this saturation. Um, but one thing that a camera is really good at is it forces you to frame and framing forces you to look and find the sort of beauty that you want to frame that's worth framing. And then after a while of using a camera, you start seeing it when you're not looking through the viewfinder. It teaches you to see without that camera. And so I think that the kind of sleep trackers we build are actually really disposable. Use them five times. They'll help you attend again to hypnagogia. They'll help you frame it by framing N1 sleep. This is a point I want to focus on. This is a kind of mental experience that's now accessible to me. And now, actually, without the sleep tracker, it's recognizable to me so that I can, for instance, use the Stormy device five times and get to know N1. And then on my own, without N1, I can start to feel... For me, for instance, oh, my hands are getting heavy. That means I'm slipping into sleep. That means I can play around with incubating my micro dreams and hypnagogia. So I think these sleep trackers are, are not really meant um, in the same way a camera is not really meant. Um, they're not meant for focusing on the camera, but focusing on the world. Um, and I just wanted to end with two art pieces that I think are kind of beautiful and informative for this conversation. This is um, Janine and Tony doing a piece where their sleep is tracked and then the waves is focused on REM, but the EEG signals are then woven into a blanket each night. And then that blanket is slept in um, and it creates this really big, beautiful, immersive sleep environment where one's literally wrapping oneself in the kind of measurement 
um, that you're getting from sleep. And I, I think this is, uh, especially with the talk that we just heard, useful because the, 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 the kind of ways we measure ourselves, especially when we're talking about the brain sciences, um, are the ways we define ourselves in wake. And especially as we think about the kind of subjective, objective splits in something like mm, nightmare content, nightmare distress, or subjective sleep quality and objective sleep quality. I think there has to be a lot of humility with the kind of definitions we give people because they they wrap themselves in those definitions as they slip into sleep. And then the last one I wanted to show is a an art piece um, from an artist I really love named Dario um, Roblito. And um, he extracted some of the first uh, studies on sleep and dreams, which were also some of the first um, brain imaging studies, which were from the late 19th century from Angelo Mosso, who is an electrophysiologist. Um, and Mosso was working to understand specifically the brain beat. He was working with a patient um, named Giovanni Thron, who had a bit of exposed brain from an injury and who was mute. And the brain was moving. And so Mosso put a piece of gutta percha, like uh, rubber latex, on that exposed brain. And those slight perturbations, the heartbeat in the brain, would move a single human hair. And that single human hair would draw in candle soot. So we got the first kind of undulations, the sort of signals we're really used to from EEG. And Angelo Mosso would lean down and he would whisper things into Giovanni's ear. And it was useful for Giovanni to be sleeping so he could be so still. And he would whisper things like being scolded or being shamed, or you can see in the middle, ear lightly touched with a feather while sleeping or undulation or name softly called while sleeping. And I was really interested in the context of um, this talk and the kind of intimacy of that measurement, um, the delicacy of the human hair, the whispering in the ear. I think that there's um, not the same kind of distance um, that we have right now. In, in my experience, um, I've been an fMRI tech for a long time where somebody is sort of far away in a shielded room and they disappear into the machine and what comes out is an image and that image is mapped onto a standardized brain atlas. And I think there's a different kind of intimacy in the beginnings here um, of sleep and dream science that I think is something to reach back towards. And so I'll just end um, with these questions, which are how can sleep science define and measure with more humility or measure more intimately? So we don't create these kinds of objective and subjective splits perhaps. And then if scientists or technologists enable control via measurement techniques in the way that some of the sleep trackers um, we build enable a different kind of control, are we responsible for distributing that, that power? Um, what sort of responsibility does measuring come with? And then I'm really curious also if there's, if there's ways to quantify and not control. It seems um, like the two go hand in hand today or vice versa. And then um, thinking about the talk that we just heard, um, what about closed loop systems where somebody is entirely an agent, their data is not being sent to a cloud, no diagnosis is being sent to them. It's only for use in interactions at home, which, which, which generate experiences, subjective experience that are verifiable um, with the individual as an agent or thinking about inter-user connections. If this kind of measurement can be a way um, somebody's research, like, like, like Mark, who's on the call, um, if it can be an instrument instead for empathetic um, communication and connection. Um, so yeah, I'll end with that. And thank you for having me. And I'm excited to talk. Well, thank you so much for that um, provocative uh, expose of your work. Um, very exciting. Um, so I think I'll just um, open up the floor since I'm sure there are questions uh, that are um, ready to go. But if, um, And uh, yes, uh, thank you both for your uh, really uh, interesting um, and, uh, you know, futuristic talk talks at the same time, since these seem the things that we're not quite um, all using, but will be perhaps um, encountering soon. Um, so first question, um, sorry if I say your name wrong, uh, Salix. You got it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, both of you, for your presentations. Good to see you, Adam. Um, question for you. Love the idea of thinking about measuring with more humility and intimacy. And I wonder what you think about turning that on 
the sleep stages as we define them according to you know specific eeg and you know of brain frequencies like is there a way to revisit that model i think it's, i think that's that's great and and i'll also um just be sure, sure to say that there are people more qualified to answer that question than me on this call right now um but my my thoughts are um are that a definition serves a purpose um, and that I think it's really useful to remind people when you hand them a definition, a definition like N1, um, at least in, in my context, I'm handing them a definition so that they understand the kind of parameters they can set via this Dormio app. And I can say, oh, I think that when you have a change in 5 BPM, it may go along with this kind of subjective experience. And that might be an experience that would maximize something like dream recall, which is something you're searching for. I think that 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 within an interaction context, like a human computer interaction context, these definitions have a really clear purpose. Um, and so, and and I don't really live in the diagnostic world um, where they have a very different sort of purpose that I think is a lot heavier in a way because I'm 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 really able to say to someone, hey this is what the literature says about these signals changing and how it goes along with your subjective experience. But I don't know anything about your subjective experience. So if what happens is you don't recall any dreams, then maybe you should shift instead what I think is going to be predictive of catching N1 for you. And you should maybe try three BPM change. And then if you have a kind of dream recall that you really enjoy, go with that. That's your N1. Doesn't matter to me. Um, and so I, I, I don't have to engage in the, in the kind of standardization um, that I would have to engage in if I was dealing with diagnostics and insurance policies and some of the things which I'm learning about now working with folks who who are working with the with the VA, the, the, the U.S. Offer, uh, Office of Veterans Affairs, where um, the kind of choices we make around something like um, a sleep stage or um, uh, around um, diagnostics have huge, huge implications and have to be standardized. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know like what what other folks, there, there are lots of people who have spent more time with a PSG than I have that I'm looking at right now. Um, I think Kenton was next, uh, maybe he has some answers. Oh, I get, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I don't actually have any answers. I've just got uh, questions, but first a comment, fantastic presentations by both of you, really, really exciting stuff going on there. Um, I wanna ask a question uh, for, for, for both of you and it, it's, based in part uh, on my own work, my own fascination with some physicians from the past, in particular Edmund Jacobson. And I can remember many years ago interviewing one of his technicians, and they would describe a situation where people would go into his electrophysiological laboratory in Chicago, and, uh, and, and they, would, uh, they would try to sleep there, and they would claim to have struggled to sleep, and, and then they would be shown the very sophisticated uh, uh, EOG, EMG, the polysonography setup that they had provided there. And uh, the technician said, oh, what we did is we disabused them right away of the fact that they hadn't slept all night, in fact, demonstrated to them that they had. So in that instance, where things were going on in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, um, before REM, um, or sort of before REM, uh, you know, there's a real clear role of expertise going on. And I didn't hear either, um, either of you talk about expertise, but I, I especially with uh, Adam's uh, response just now, I feel it nibbling around the edges a little bit. And so I'd, I'd, I'd just like to ask, uh, where, does, where, if anywhere, does expertise configure into these two, two worlds that you've described? And then I have an additional question, and that's one about resistance. Um, uh, uh, or maybe another way of describing it as non-users. Do you have anything to say about non-users? And I have to say, in a way, I'm kind of one, I'm surrounded by people in my household who do sometimes or have in the past wear worn Fitbits and use them to track their sleep, but that's not me. And that's actually a really explicit choice. It's also informed my choice of why when I went to be tested for sleep apnea, I ended up walking out of the sleep lab. I just left. Um, and there's also resistance to what can I say, the technological incursion of uh, dream incubation, because of course there are other much more longstanding ways, which Adam referred to right at the end, um, of, uh, of attending to dreams that don't involve um, a certain kind of technological interface, I guess. So then two questions, one about expertise, another one about resistance. Thanks, Kenton. 
Um, yeah, I can go first. <laughs> I'm not an expert in sleep tracking, I would say. I think I sort of approached it more from agency of devices um, that are intimately related and how they affect behaviors. And that's how I got into, I think I was interested in sleep as well, but I learned, I learned from about it from walking into it somehow. But I think it's an important question or interesting question because I think it's really what, what does it mean to track sleep and where does it come from? And from what I understand is it's an expertise, but it's also just agreed standards that a lot of different groups of people have agreed of have agreed on over the course of time and we're still sort of using them but there is nothing to say that we can't change them or just in not invent but I guess just label them differently or <laughs> structure them differently in our research um, yeah I, I don't know if that answers your question at all but <laughs> or can you yeah It it, it 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 does to a certain extent. Um, it, I I guess what you are describing is uh, what Simon Williams calls the the healthization of sleep, um, which is really kind of driven by I think the consumer instead of uh, um, the uh, diagnostic standards that uh, seem to be uh, the property of, of of expert knowledge. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry. Do you want to respond? Or? No, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I struggle a lot with the expertise question. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a great one. Um, one of the things I think is really fun about something um, like sleep and dream science um, is it's, 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 I think, very difficult to be the kind of expert that I'm used to in the neurosciences that holds the brain at a distance and looks at it and pokes it and says, this is this part and functional neuroanatomy. Um, there's a kind of first person, third person um, leaking that I think makes it clear that you're studying something which is bigger than the context in which you're studying it. Just to give you an example, um, so if, if, you wanna, if you wanna be, uh, I think it's really cool that sleep scientists have their dreams changed by studying sleep and by studying dreams. And I think it makes it really hard to claim that you could know something um, wholly when you're trying to sort of keep it over there and talk about what it is and it's changing you. And as it changes you, you change how you see it. I think there's this leakiness. And I'll, I'll, just a quick story about um, dreams being something that's a little bit too big to put on a, to put on a microscope slide and be confident that you're an expert in. Um, when I was starting out, um, I was working with, with Robert Stickgold, who I don't think is here, but who I think a lot of you probably know. Um, and I, I was really surprised that, wow, it seems like we can choose things for people to dream about and they reliably dream about them. And somebody sent me an email and said, Hey, um, I want to have a dream where I, uh, speak with my mother who passed away. Um, and I said, well, I don't know. It doesn't really make a particular difference to me. Here's the device. Um, you go in the room. I'll see you in an hour. Um, and this and 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 this person came out crying and needing to talk about it. Um, and I said, "Oh, oh, oh, gosh! Like I'm not really the right person for you to talk to. I'm not a psychiatrist. I I, th I thought I was just making this sort of little device and kind of poking around in the dream world. And isn't that fun? Um, dream dreams with their gravity. I think." Um, make themselves known. The the sort of seriousness, um, the kind of ontological seriousness, makes itself known even when you try to be an expert. They're so big and heavy. And I said, "Oh gosh, I'm not the right person to be studying this." Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, um, just on the expertise thing, um, my my next step personally is um, heading off to a little island called Baranoff Island. Um, where um, there are the Haida and Tlingit Native Alaskan tribes um, who really uh, live with and by dreams um, in a way that I am totally, totally excited to understand uh, more about um, what it means to take uh, a dream as um, completely truthful, what it means to take subjectivity as completely truthful, how that can guide religion and politics in a different way. I, I think that um, there's going to be a really different sort of expertise there than the kind of expertise I've gotten to know um, or recognize at MIT. Um, 
And I'm really interested in a more kind of embodied or communal or human expertise and what it looks like. But yeah, totally. I don't know who's an expert on dreams. I haven't met one yet. Um, but yeah. Um, but I talk too much. So maybe I maybe resistance at a later time if, in case there's other stuff. Maybe we can see what uh, Mark's question is, uh, if there's a way to tie things right. together. Thank you. I hope I hope I'm I'm audible. Um, can I just thank Anna and Adam for your, your your wonderful talks? And I just wanted to comment on one thing that Adam had said because I've been writing about it recently myself, which is this whole problem that until we can get independent groups in uh, experiments who have dream content that we have randomly allocated to them, we're going to be the the Anna the 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 experiment that I usually refer to, which is like the one that Adam says was the Rose Cartwright one, where people who dreamt of their partner while undergoing divorce were more likely to get over the divorce. And of course, it's just a correlational finding, as Adam was saying, you know, the, the people who get over the divorce might be the ones who therefore are able to dream about them. And I'm just grateful to what Adam has said, because I had thought that it's going to be way in the future that we could do this random allocation to groups but it seems to be a lot sooner than I had thought. And I had always thought that you are somehow going to have to do something to people's brains. You have to divide people into two groups, do something to these people's brains to make them say, dream of the partner you're having a divorce from, or dream of, in Adam's uh, terms, uh, the, uh, the drug that you're trying to get uh, off. Uh, whereas actually, it could very well be, as, as Adam has said, you could actually just whisper the word to them as they're falling off to sleep. And that then hopefully for some people in that experimental condition goes into their dream. And we then see whether the people who dreamt of divorce or drugs uh, are different from the people who didn't. And in fact, you've even got an extra control condition there which is that you can have people who you whisper the word to just before N1, and some of them might not dream of it. So you've got a control for thinking, maybe you're just affecting the brain and not the dream content. And that's then having the subsequent, um, uh, that's then having the subsequent uh, effect on what you're <laughs> so I've just written something and I'm now going to work out how I can I, how I can somehow get uh, something that I'm <laughs> into a publication quickly uh, because uh, the the paper you've said where you you're thinking of that seems to be very relevant. So thank you. Any co comments, Adam? Manner responses? Oh, I think that's great. I know. I think it's great. I mean, I, I think the one. I think the one thing I'm slightly worried about with the kind of creation of that methodology um, is something Anna mentioned: um, people trusting the data more than their own feelings. I think there might be this funny, fuzzy area where we have a successful dream incubation, but somebody doesn't remember the dream that they had, perhaps, and we tell them this is the dream that you had, and they say, "I don't know that I had that dream," and we say, "Oh, this is likely to change the course of your." major depressive disorder or something or substance use disorder. I, I think this, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried though. I think it'd be harder. That same subjective objective split um, that that um, folks were talking about earlier with something like sleep quality. I'm worried about these experiments creating a subjective objective split around dream content also. Um, uh, just curious about that as we, as, as, as sort of as scientists um, do more of the kind of controlling of conditions. But yeah, no, I think it's a. I'm, I'm, I'm totally excited to read, read what you write about that. Anna, do you want to respond, or should we get the next question? Um, and I find this really fascinating as well. I think I just have more questions now after this. Uh, just about yeah, maybe maybe I'll ask one. Like, how is the? What is the like? Okay, measuring is one thing, but then. What is the long time effect on this? Does it? Re I like the idea of saying, for example, the camera or this comparison, how the camera is a device to help you or understand you how to look. But then, if you if you start to look at your dreams through this, like how does this change your understanding of yourself or your dreams long term? 
with with without or without being with being conscious about it or without. Nick, Nicholas, do you want to uh, ask a question? Yes. Um, well, thank you so much, both of you, for your talks. Um, and I just had a little uh, question for Adam. Um, so the question is, um, like, what would be uh, for you the main uh, implications of uh, dream incubation and uh, more generally speaking on uh, dream engineering? Um, because so in the case where we are able to uh, efficiently and reliably influence uh, the contents of uh, dream like hypnagogia uh, slash uh, micro dreams, um, which is what you're pretty much achieving because I uh, remember you have sort of a 67% um, incorporation of the word tree in the dreams. Uh, how, like, how do you think this methodology could be used to understand uh, more about dreams and specific, specifically whether it could provide new insights into uh, dream formation or the memory sources of uh, dreaming? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll say a couple things. Um, I'll say that, um, you know, I've done four, four studies here, and then um, the folks at Duke have done one study, um, but it's really young research. Um, and so I think us getting a kind of us getting a results that we feel are reliable in the lab is a really, it's a really limited, really specific context. It's a really limited set of subjects. So um, I think we're, 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 we're certainly not at the point where, um, I don't know, I feel like we have sort of the kind of reliable or total control that um, sometimes it feels like people are really scared that we, we do have, but not, not saying that you're saying anything kind of doomsday scenario E. But then I also would say that, um, like the kind of research that Tori, who's also on the call, has done on hypnagogia, that was the the foundation for all of my interest in the subject. Um, a lot of what we can learn from that is similar to what we can learn from this. I think it's um, I think it's 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 more about the kind of um, translational possibilities. So um, we already have this beautiful data from Mark talked about Raw's uh, Cartwright's work. Um, um, I've read um, all, all kinds of stuff. You know, um, I think Claudia just, oh, Claudia's still here. Yeah, um, just thinking about um, uh, flying dreams and thinking about how memory works and when some dreams will come back to your experiences will come back to you. We learn a lot about how we encode information. There's, we've learned a, a huge amount about hypnagogia from those sorts of studies. This stuff just says, okay, we have some idea that maybe dreaming of something is related to how well you remember it in the morning or like Isabel Arnold's stuff on uh, it's related, dreaming of a test is related to how well you do on that test in the morning. This just says, um, we have this interesting association. Can we now say, um, actually, this is an intervention. Um, you want to do better on your test in the morning. Here's a tool to dream of it specifically and see if it improves your performance. I think it's a um, the no this is maybe sounds like a kind of cop out answer, but a lot of the knowledge has to already be there for us to do the translation from correlation to causation. And so I think that at least in its beginning stages, this isn't so much a tool that is going to say um, this is how hypnagogia uh, works. This is a tool that's going to say something like um, these are lots of ideas we already have from years of research about how hypnagogia works, and here's a new way to put that knowledge into use. Um, if that's a, a fair answer. But the things that people learn from trying it on themselves have been extremely varied and nobody wakes up, in my experience in our lab, nobody wakes up and says what I think they're gonna say about their experience. Um, and so what they find there is totally exciting and, and up, up to them. But I think at least for my first next few years of research, it's really just taking stuff that folks on this call have already done and, and, and translating it into applications. Um, yeah, but I bet other people have lots of thoughts about that. Um, yeah, I get lots of, yes, implications. Are there uh, people who want, someone wants to respond to that or have other questions um, for Adam or Anna?
I have a question for you, I guess, Adam. Um, I mean, I, I, I was kind of had a same uh, similar reaction to Anna's in terms of like, do we do we want do we want to be having do we want to control um, this part of our uh, of our selfhood and our life experience? Uh, and um, the this idea that um, I wonder if in your in your tests or your in your studies, do you um, uh, is there a difference for you in terms of whether you give the prompt to someone like the tree versus uh, when the person said like, I want to do about my husband. It's such a much, that's a, that's a very different kind of, um, I would guess, experience or a lot, lot less neutral. So I wonder how you account for that or do you actually have two different kinds of studies or where, where you stand on that kind of part of the study? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said at the end, um, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if this was a closed loop system, thinking of sort of an intra user and then also a communal inter user. And then how is that different from having a kind of hierarchy of power? And how does somebody else's voice, specifically a scientist's voice telling you what to dream about? How does that maybe come across more effective? All really good questions. The only thing I've done on it is a little bit of piloting. Um, where we were just testing the efficacy of dream incubation with somebody's own voice versus with um, my voice. It was much it was much more effective with the voice of the scientist they had just met. Um, I think that I can't quite, you know, there's all sorts of uh, expectancy effects that people talk about. And I think that the, you know, the lab coat really helps um, in the sense that uh, a, a, a dream is in many ways a kind of compilation of expectations. Um, and I think in, in the sense that um, a, a, a scientist or whoever's, you know, pretending to be a scientist for the day um, has a kind of power to create expectation, an expectation of healing, an expectation of disorder. Um, in that way, the scientist also has a lot of power to create a dream um, in the sense, oh, you will dream about this, you will dream about that. Um, so I think, I think so far, um, a voice with some measure of, I don't know, authority um, has been more effective in, in limited tests. The question, the question of voice is inter interesting, but and also there's the question of what that voice is saying, if it's saying something benign, like dream of a tree or, or like dream of a trauma. Oh. Yeah. Oh, you were asking about the content, not about who said it. I, I was, but that's an interesting answer as well. So <laughs> saying stuff. Um, yeah, cool. Sorry. Um, no, sorry. Yeah, cool. Um, all of my my five uh, fork uh, tree uh, rabbit uh, benign benign. In fact, um, there's an there's an uh, a library which affectively matched words. Um, we have affect in the in the cognitive sciences. We affectively match uh, pictures and sounds and words. Um, I pick um, these words that I incubate because they're affectively matched. I tested on I think it's ten thousand people. Um, so specifically because they're they are um, not a uh, dream of uh, husband, et cetera, et cetera. They're, oh, just dream of a fork. There you go. Yep. Um, we have, we have um, one last question. Uh, we'll go a couple of minutes over, if that's okay. Um, Sean is asking, if sleep trackers are also social agents, what kind of dreams might these devices have? <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> I get. I mean, maybe maybe the dream is that what they process from the data they collect and then share with you through the. Is that their dream? Is that how they dream, <laughs> or is that a more active thing they're doing? Because they also have the scientists in the background telling them what to do. Right? They had to. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, <laughs> I think it's a great question. I think I think my my my, my first thought is that um. Uh, uh, Google Deep Dream is not a is not a dream, um, and I think it's uh, you know um, like the American Dream as kind of a popular reference to what a dream is that has nothing to do with what a dream is. Like whose whose dreams are about a white picket fence and golden retrievers? I think there's this idea now um, that because artificial intelligence is kind of akin to human intelligence then feed forward generative adversarial networks um, are sort of akin to uh, dreams. There was a recent paper, I think by Eric McLeod at, at Tufts, which was talking about um, AI dreaming. And I, I think it's all based on an assumption that um, the artificial intelligence has something to do with human intelligence that I'm not very convinced by. But 
I don't know what a sleep tracker dreams of. I think it's a provocative question. Um, yeah. I, I got a nice. It's a nice note to end on. I think some speculation of uh, about our machines. Anna, did you have a final thought that you, that you want to share? Oh, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone on the call who was, yeah, really foundational to my thesis. And I've loved the last talks that you've had the sleep salons. But yeah, thanks for thanks for hanging, Anna. Thanks for talking. Great to thank meet you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both me, uh, very much for thank you both. We'll have this this talk will be on YouTube as well, um, hopefully and soon. And um, join us for the next salon, which is on November sixteenth. Um, we'll be talking about the politics of sleep, so it'll be a nice perhaps continuation of uh, this talk. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a nice uh, have a nice rest of the day.